Right, good morning everybody. Um, you'll have to forgive me, I can't stand in small spaces and given it's a short wide room, I'm going to have to walk about a bit this morning. Um, I have to explain myself a little bit. Uh, you may have noticed the job title. Yes, it was pretentious on intentionally. Um, I have a job inside Microsoft. One of the things that Microsoft loves to do is we love to talk to uh, our customers about technology and products, bless us. One of the things we don't do enough is talk about the human beings that use those products. And so we've created this role inside Microsoft called Envisioning, which is helping to people to see the future of human beings. Wouldn't that be nice? Helping to see, understand what people are going to do, how are they going to live, work, and play, and use technology. So we decided that a job about the future of humanity needed some sort of pompous job title, so Chief Envisioning Officer. There's a second reason for inventing this job title, because when I was a kid, I said, Mum, do you know what? One day, when I grow up, I'm going to be CEO at Microsoft. You just watch me. <laughs> and would you know it? the position actually is coming vacant. So I've already got the title, you know, search over as far as I'm concerned. Um, I also have a few confessions to make. Um, so this may come as a surprise to you. I know that the long hair and the beard may give it away, but in a past life, I'm really ashamed to say um, I was an IT consultant. Don't hate me. And one of the things you learn as an IT consultant is that actually this is about taking people on a journey, helping people to understand the challenges that they face rather than necessarily giving them answers. I also need to tell you a bit of my history. Again, I know you will find this incredibly difficult to believe, but a bloke with long hair and a beard working for one of the world's biggest technology companies also quite like Star Trek. I know, it's a shock, a surprise. <laughs> um, but Star Trek's really important, right? And let me tell you why Star Trek's important. Because when I was a kid, I grew up on an unhealthy diet of Star Trek and comic books, and what I learned from Star Trek specifically is that technology is supposed to be a force for good in our society. It's supposed to be that something enables humanity to become greater than the sum of its parts, and I get that that sounds very grandiose. Technology is supposed to help people. Technology is supposed to empower people. Technology is supposed to revolve around the individual rather than the other way around. And the problem is, I've spent 20 odd years in the IT industry, and the older I get, the more cynical I become. And what I worry about most is technology should have been a release. It should have been something that enables us to do great things. Instead, increasingly, it becomes a prison. It becomes the thing that constrains and controls how we work. How many of you don't get enough email? <laughs> right, it's a punchline in itself, and this is part of the problem. So my job today is to try and open your hearts and minds to the potential of technology, to focus on the human being rather than the specifics of the technology of what we're here to do. So I'd like your help. I know I'm first up, so, and you probably had a good night last night. Um, I want you to cast your mind back to when you first heard about this conference. And you will have gone through, oh, that sounds interesting. Should I go? Should I not go? Or maybe your boss said to you, you know what, you should go. And so you reach that moment where you think, do you know what? I'm going to the conference. Fantastic. It's in London. How cool will that be? And then you get to the day that you travel out, and you're thinking, do you know what, this is going to be great, we're going to learn much, so much about this topic, because it's going to be one, I'm really looking forward to it. And I want to ask you, how many of you on your way here yesterday morning, or even the night before, how many of you sat, if you flew here, and thought about the mechanics of the, of the gas turbine engine, the jet engine, that was going to be propelling you? Could you put your hand up if you thought about that? How many of you thought about the destination, about London, all of the great things? Come on, play along at home. This is not going to work if you don't play. <laughs> and the point of that, right, is we're all here because we care about the mechanics of what's going on. But the reality is the people that we're trying to serve, the services that we're trying to deliver, are all about the destination. And what I want to do today is I want to focus on these individuals, the people who will be consuming the products, the services, the environment that you create throughout this whole change. This is where the focus is. There's a little bit of irony here, because actually I do, when I travel somewhere, I do think about the jet engine, only because my old man did, used to design them, and when I was a kid, he used to sit me down on the kitchen table and show me these schematic drawings, and, you know, yeah, I'm really interested in that, that Star Trek's on. Um, <laughs> so please, let's focus on the destination, let's think about the human beings, and with that in mind, let me also talk to you about how society is changing. How many of you have got a computer at home? Put your hand up if you have a computer at home. Fantastic. Keep your hand up. If the computer you have at home is better than the one you have at work. Right, fantastic. Majority of people. I do this to every audience that I speak to. And the point is, we live in incredible times. I love doing it to a public sector audience, works in any country. At this point, if you do that test to a public sector audience, it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel at that point. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Um, <laughs> the point with this is we have incredibly rich 
technical experiences in our personal lives. You know, we are at home, we've got grandparents Skyping their grandkids, we shop online, we play games online, we communicate with our friends. We have this wonderfully rich technical experience that transforms the way we live our personal lives. And then we go to work. And typically, people are greeted with this kind of experience. Some long-haired, beardy git like me in IT who just likes to say, mm, no, you can't do that. I'm really sorry. And the danger for me is if we're not mindful of the fact that society has moved on, technology is no longer this special thing that you only see in a place of work. It's something that we use inherently as part of everything that we do. Our normal, everyday life is powered by technology. If you start thinking about that, and you start thinking that the consumers that you're trying to reach with your brands are thinking in exactly the same way, then you can start to do wonderful things. If you think that consumers are stupid, if you still think about the dumb user, then actually all you're going to do is you're going to plan for a retrograde sort of implementation of what's going on. Now, I want to share to you some of Microsoft's insight about how we think this is changing. We think what we're going through is this thing called the digitization of society. And it's fundamentally different from where we've been. So if you remember the old days, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we had the, we had the World Wide Web and we had search. And search basically would be the gateway to a whole bunch of documents, HTML files. It would help us find the stuff that we need. But it was all based on this old you know, metaphor of hyperlinks and a library and 10 blue links. But the reality today, the web is something very, very different. We think about the web at Microsoft in three domains. We think about a web of people, we think about a web of places, and a web of things. And instead of the World Wide Web, we start to think about the web of the world. And the, the only difference between those two things is the web of the world revolves around the individual rather than the individual having to go to all these websites. We'll just walk through this. And underneath that, there are some technology trends that we think are important that, again, from the human being's perspective, fundamentally change the experience that you're going to deliver. So number one is understanding about search as the gateway. We don't think search is just a way of answering questions. We think search is a way of stitching together disparate services to bring them back to the consumer to create wonderful experiences. I'll tell you a little story. As a Microsoft employee, you will not be surprised to know I love Xbox. I have three Xboxes at home, fair enough. I have one in my kitchen, because I do most of the cooking at home. And my experience with Xbox is I will go home tonight and I will start cooking tea, probably burgers and chips, because that's how we roll in the Copland household. And uh, I'll spark up my Xbox and I will say to the TV, Xbox, Bing the Clash. And my Xbox will use Bing to curate a playlist of the Clash, which then starts playing. Now, I just want you to consider for a moment, that's a search engine powering that experience. Search is a fundamentally different thing today than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. And we have to start opening our minds to what search could become in terms of how we stitch together disparate services, how people want to consume services. Because gone are the days where I have to go to all of these individual websites or these individual applications. Search powers all this and brings it to the consumer. We then have this place called the web of knowledge. And this is kind of the web as we've always thought of it. Collection of society, everything society knows is there on the web. Every fact, every figure, every opinion, every joke, it's all there. These are the things that, you know, historically we thought about. The web is this thing, if we could just understand where everything is. But there are two more domains that are really important. I want to talk to you about these today. There's the web of people. One of the most important advances in the internet has been social media. And the magic of social media is not the bloody stupid messages we send to each other every day. You know, presenting at GTLD today, check me out. Just had the world's best coffee, send, right? That's not the importance of social media. The importance of social media is the connection of people, the network of people. Because if you understand how people are related to each other, you can start to change the way we deliver services. Again, I'll give you a personal example. In the US, we link our search results to Facebook with your permission. So when you search, not only do you get presented back a series of normal web results, you also get a series of connections to people you know. Let me tell you why that's important. We had the service live in the UK a, uh, a while ago, and I was running it here. And I was, uh, my office is on Victoria Street, just down the road from here. And I'm walking down Victoria Street, it's lunchtime, and I'm searching for sushi on my mobile phone. Now, any good search engine will tell you the 10 nearest restaurants at that point. But that's OK, that's pretty nice. But from that ten, list of 10, I don't know which is the best, which is the worst, which is the cheapest, which is the most expensive, which is the one that does that southern style Japanese sushi that only I like. Don't know, just 10 nearest. However, in our service, when we tap into the web of people, I start to see which of my friends like the restaurants near me. Now, the change that affords is I know my friends because they're real people, unlike most people's Facebook friends. 
These are actually real individuals. And this is a true story. What happened to me is I saw my buddy, Simon, had liked this one restaurant. Now, I know Simon. I grew up with him. And I grew up in a place called Derby, which is in the East Midlands in the UK. And the thing you should know about Derby is it's about as far away from the coast as you can get anywhere else, 200 miles in any direction to the nearest coastline. The other thing I know about Simon is he never left Derby. He's still there to this day, living a very happy life. So here's a guy who is 200 miles from the coast, telling me about sushi. And the other thing I know about Simon, because he comes from the East Midlands, because he's so far away from the coast, I know that the only thing he knows about raw dead fish is when it's battered and deep fried. So at that point, if he's telling me there's a good restaurant, a good sushi restaurant, I know it's going to be crap. It's going to be rubbish. So I'm never going to go there. <laughs> right? Just brilliant. Now, again, negative example, but the difference in the results is trust. Because I know that person, I have a level of trust. I understand who he is. That changes how I interpret the information that's, that gets given to me. That is the power of the web of people. And then there's the web of places. And we're beginning to do this more and more. How many of you found the hotel today using maybe a mapping application on your smartphone? So absolutely wonderful, brilliant. We can find roughly where the hotel is. We're moving to a world where every single attribute of our physical world is mapped out and made available as a service. Because I want to live in a world where, let's say I'm in my office in Victoria Street, or even outside here, and I know that I'm going to get the train to Brighton later on this afternoon. Well, if I'm in a wheelchair, don't just tell me, like we do in the UK, that every mainline trail station, train station has disabled access facilities. That's actually bloody useless to me, because I know that. What I really want to know, if I'm in a wheelchair, is from the very position that I'm in to the platform I have to get to, where are the curbs dropped? Which of the eight doors to Victoria Station is the one that has the access ramp? And if I can access that information and I can build that into my services, again, we've got this incredibly cohesive, contextual service that we can provide. And all of this brings to this place called the web of the world. And the web of the world is so important because take, take today, right? You've traveled to London. You've come from maybe the UK. You've maybe come further afield. And I would guess that you probably went to a whole series of websites in order to get here. You will have looked at travel websites. You will have looked at your airline's website. You will have looked at destination websites. But all of the time, this is you going to different places, to different domains. You're having to do all the legwork. Well, hang on a minute. If we know who you are, and we know what you like, and we know where you are, and we know what you want to do, why are we forcing you to do all the legwork? Why couldn't we curate an experience and bring all of that to you in a single sense that's in the context of what you're trying to do? And that is the point of the web of the world. And then there's other things. So we're into the technology trends now. There's the power of these things. These things are fundamentally transformative. And what they do is they enable us a window into the digital world wherever we are. They enable us to access the best of the information in the digital world and bring that to us so that we can change the way we behave in the real world. How many of you have stood in a shop or a store and used one of these to check the price of the product that you're about to buy, right? I have, because obviously I'm a bit tight. <laughs> And the point about that is not the death of the retail high street, but it's actually here we are dipping into information to change our physical experience, what we do in the real world. And I want you to extend that. Think about all of the things that you could do with that service. I'll give you my example. I'm a World War I military history nut. Don't know why, something about that war that's kind of obscene, but also quite intriguing. And I walk down Whitehall probably two or three times a week. Now, Whitehall is sort of the, the main sort of government uh, road, but most of the government departments, the MOD, but they also has this thing on Whitehall called the Cenotaph, which is the UK's National War Memorial. And I would love it if I'm, when I'm walking down Whitehall, my phone chirps and says, listen, Dave, you haven't got anything on for the next couple of hours. The phone knows that because it's got my schedule, knows who I am, knows the things I like, and it says, hey, come over here. I want to show you something. Takes me over to the Cenotaph, I hold up my phone, picks out a name on the Cenotaph and starts curating a story, tells me about what's going on, shows me information about that. It's all possible because these things enable it. These things become possible. They become a window into the digital world. That is the transformation of smartphones, not the fact that we can check our email or we can play Angry Birds, but actually how we open up that digital world. Now, we created some visioning videos about that. We did some work with, in the UK, there's a charity called Guide Dogs for the Blind, and they provide dogs to help visually impaired people navigate the world around them. And we wanted to demonstrate what the web of the world could look like to someone in that sort of sense. So we created a video. This is a video. It's set in the future. Here's Bill. He's blind. He's trying to plan a day out for his family in London. 
So if we use this search to curate an experience, we're accessing what we know about Bill. We're bringing together, here's a, su a suggested list of itineraries based on the stuff we know Bill likes to do. We know he's going to take his son with him. His son's not visually impaired. He's taking his dad with him, who's slightly visually impaired. We curate an experience. We bring everything. We bring the travel. He's now out in the world, and we're using the web of places to help him navigate. So he knows where the platform edge is. He knows where the street furniture is. He knows specifically where to stand on the platform to get into the train. Then he's out in the real world. We're helping him navigate around busy spaces. We're helping. We're curating this experience. Remember, this is all in the context of him, so that he can navigate his world. And then finally, we end up in a museum. This is the Natural History Museum here in London. And he's looking at an exhibit, and he's using the technology, not just to orientate himself around the environment, but equally to get information, not just on the exhibit he's looking at, but the things that his friends know about the exhibit, when they were there, what they thought, people he knows and trusts. So this is the web of, world, of the world at play. In the context of the individual, what can we do? What can we do to bring this incredible experience to life, rather than sending them to a bunch of disparate websites? And then we've got to start thinking beyond the web, you know, even beyond applications, because the consumer experience of the future is going to be based on the context of what they're trying to do. It's not going to be sending them to websites. It's not going to be sending them even to apps. It's going to be bringing this experience. We think part of the future of search, for example, is not the search homepage. We think more about search as the engine. We talk about APIs, application program interfaces, that people can access and bring their own applications to life, bring their own experiences to life. In this kind of world, the web's role changes. It becomes a glue. It becomes the mechanism to stitch together this stuff rather than a destination. No presentation from an IT guy would be complete without a slide on big data. I just feel like it's my duty to jump on the bandwagon with everybody else. But data is massively important because what data enables us to do is fundamentally change the experience, to create a much more personalized experience. We're used to personalization today, right? How many of you shop at Amazon or some similar website? And my Amazon experience is this. Welcome back, Dave. I see you've bought books on Spider-Man. Would you like books on Batman? Right? On one level, pretty good. On another level, Actually, do you know what? There are two sides to Batman. There is the dark, brooding, brutal, gothic Batman, and then there's the slightly camp 1960s TV show. <laughs> They're two very different things, and you need to understand which one of those two I'm going to like. And so we think this personalization, as good as it is today, needs to be much, much better. And we think the way to do that is to understand the context of the individual. And I get that there are all sorts of challenges about how we might do this. Privacy is the biggest one. As a society, we really, really have to understand what privacy means to us. And we all have a responsibility to make that service better. But that aside, let me just talk to you a bit more about the context. I'll do the build. So our proposition is that if you can understand the context of the individual, then you can deliver true personalization. And for us, we think about context in four domains. Number one, we think about emotional context. So what is your emotional state? Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you a bit angry? Whatever it might be. Because if you think about how you consume services today, think about music. You will choose to listen to different music based on whether you're happy or sad. And if we can understand that, we can start to curate a different experience. We already have technology. The first time somebody demonstrated Connect, it was called Project Natal. Are you familiar with Connect? It's the camera device we have for Xbox, enables you to interact with the Xbox without using a controller. And the first demo I saw of Connect was a game called Milo and Kate. And the principle of the game is the camera would look at the player and decide whether the player was smiling or frowning. If the player was frowning, it would change the storyline. It would tell you jokes until you smiled. Basic emotional recognition exists. And actually, that's, that technology has progressed. And then there's your social context. It's kind of like your social status, but it's more about who's with you at the moment at which you're consuming the service. So for me, as, let me give you an example. I will behave differently at home depending on who's in the room with me. Let's say I'm watching the football. If it's just me, I'll be sitting there watching the football and I'll see a goal, I'll pause, I'll rewind, I'll watch the replay, all that sort of stuff. If I'm there sat with my wife and son, that's just going to annoy them. So I can't do that. If I'm sat with a bunch of mates at home, drinking beer, watching the football, again, that's going to change what I do. If I'm down the pub with a bunch of friends and enemies, enemies, that's going to, still early, come on. Um, that's going to change what I do. You know, and if I'm sat in a sad, lonely hotel room somewhere near a motorway intersection, you know, that's my IT consultant life, watching the football over a live stream connected to my friends on social media, again, I'm going to behave differently. So if we know 
who's with you when you consume an experience, again, we can change that. We can deliver different things. So, for example, I'm sat watching the football. My family are there. You know I've got the tablet in my hand. So serve me the content there. Just give me the stuff that I need there without disrupting everybody else. And then there's the environmental context. This is something we've had pretty much uh, for a while anyway. So, for example, if I'm walking down Victoria Street searching for sushi on my mobile phone on a weekday at around 12 o'clock, we'll change the relevancy ranking and we'll basically say, do you know what, I bet you he's hungry. That's why he's doing that. If I make the same search, 7 o'clock at home tonight on my home PC, I might be hungry. I might be planning a night out in two weeks. I might be looking for a recipe. I might be looking for the history of sushi. All of those things become possible. But the fact I'm using a specific device, specific location, specific time, completely changes what I want to do. And then finally, there's this external context. And this is how we as human beings behave to the sort of mainstream media themes of the day. In the run-up to the Olympics, I guarantee you, we all thought more about sport than at any other time as a society. We have big national charity days in the UK, things like Children in Need or Sports Aid or uh, Comic Relief. And I tell you, at the moment, you know, when those things happen, there's so much in the news that we all think very differently. And our whole proposition about contextualization and personalization is that if we can stitch all of these things together using the power of big data, do it real time, and change the services real time, then we're in a very different space and we can really curate this experience that revolves around the user. Because the challenge is our consumers are different people. We all have multiple personas. You know, I'm not just Dave the bloke from Microsoft, although my wife would probably argue that. Um, I'm Dave the dad, I'm Dave the motorcyclist, I'm Dave the Star Trek freak. You know, all of these things, and I will be different people throughout the day depending on what I, I'm doing. So understanding which persona I'm in fundamentally changes your ability to change things. And then there are other technologies coming along that really start to support all of this. We're starting to change the way we interact with technology. This is a project from our labs called Digits. And it essentially enables people to use gestures to control technology. And this is where we're going. We're moving away from the keyboard and the mouse, not just solely, but to, to augment that. And all of these things change our view of technology. But there are some challenges. There are some problems we face if we're going to make this happen. So number one, and I've kind of talked about this, I would argue that our digital evolution is not perhaps progressing as much as it could. We've reached this place that I like to call the plateau of mediocrity, which is essentially, do you know what? Technology sort of works. Email's all right. Websites are OK. You know, people kind of understand them. Don't really need to do anything different, do we? And that's my problem. The whole point of this is technology is supposed to enable us to do things differently. If all we ever do with technology, and this is especially relevant to the context of today's discussion, if all we ever do is the same things we've always done, what is the point? How are we changing the experience for our consumers? How are we enabling technology in a digital society to allow us to fundamentally do things differently, better, more cost-effectively, whatever it may be? And just to illustrate how challenging this is. I've got a few examples for you. So first of all, think about how we live our work lives, how we work. Here's a piece of stock art from the 50s. I'd like you to think about in 60 years, think about all of the changes that have happened in 60 years, certainly when it comes to office communication technology, how far we've come. Genius, right? So now that there are some important differences, I would wager that the lady in this picture probably has a better job than the lady in this picture, so we've made some progress. But actually what I want you to see is here's an individual chained to a specific location to access some technology and a communications device. 60 years later. And we live in a world where we have pervasive mobile broadband. We all walk around with more power in our pockets than used to be on our desktop PCs five years ago, and yet we're still here. Here's another example. This is the first proper graphical user interface I ever used, right? I was proud to use that. I loved it. In 30 years of technology advances, think about all the things that have changed since the mid-80s when it comes to personal computers. Think how far we've come. Now, don't get lost in the Apple-Microsoft religious argument. Not important here. What I want you to see here is a piece of plastic, glass, a keyboard, and a mouse. It's exactly the same. We use this in exactly the same way that we used that. Despite all of the changes that we've had, we live in a world of natural user interfaces, of touch, of gesture, of voice, and we're still there, stuck to the bit of plastic and glass, using the tools in the same way that we've used them for 30 years. Something that's maybe closer to home, think about how we do online advertising. This is the first ever banner advertisement, mid-90s. In 18 years, how far have we come? 
we've just made it smaller. Brilliant. <laughs> and what I love about this, this is a snapshot from my phone, actually. So here I am, I'm reading The Guardian about something the Lib Dems are doing, and Samsung have placed an advert for me. It's brilliant, lovely. I'm sitting on a Windows phone, I'm reading the bloody news at this point, and Samsung think this is okay, this is acceptable for me. The whole concept of how we think of advertising is not relevant for how technology exists today. And that brings me to the point of smartphones. We talk around smartphones all the time and how wonderful they are. I would love you to show me a smartphone because I don't think they exist. Or at least, let me put it another way, we don't allow them to be smart. My phone knows where I am, knows where I'm going to be, knows who I know, knows the things I like. When does it ever use that information to change the experience? It doesn't. It's a stupid phone. It's a stupid phone because I allow it to be stupid. I have to push it into action to tell me stuff. It knows me. It knows where I am. It knows where I'm going to be. Why can't you curate? And I'm not saying this is just about Windows Phone. They all do that. And yet we think we live in these incredible times. We have to curate this experience around individuals. But underneath all of this is the basic sociological fact that we as human beings suck at change. We cannot change. We find change really hard. My favorite example is found underneath your fingertips every single day. And it's the QWERTY keyboard design. Does anybody know how old that design is? And shout it out if you do. Any guess? It's certainly pre-1950. It's 142 years old, that design. And the thing about it is it was designed for a bygone age. There are two theories as to why it was created. Number one, in a world of mechanical typewriters, if the typists got too quick, they would jam their heads and they would lose productivity until the machine could be fixed. So along comes Mr. QWERTY, not his real name, I might add. And he says, well, do you know what? If I mix the letters up a bit, then the typist can never get that quick. It was designed to impede the speed of the typist, so they could never get beyond a threshold of speed, so they could never jam their heads. Now, there's another creation theory that actually it was created in Japan for Morse code for radio operators. And again, similar problem. They're making so many mistakes. Along comes Mr. Qwerty, and he says, do you know what? If I mix up the letters, then they'll have to be really mindful about which key they press. They'll make less mistakes. <laughs> Brilliant. 142 years later, we live in a world of touch, natural user interface, voice interaction. We still use a design that is 142 years old. Its entire design premise is to be suboptimal. It's designed to be crap. Right? This is how much we suck at change. 80 years ago, along comes Mr. Dvorak, and that was his real name, and he invents a keyboard layout that is built for speed, absolutely designed to go as fast as a human being could possibly drive it. You can type 400 of the English language's most common words without ever leaving the home row on a Dvorak keyboard. It's 100 on QWERTY. Its operational efficiency is measured about 70%. It's 30 on QWERTY. But we never changed because we suck at change. And this is my problem about what we face in the technology world, is if all we ever use is the stuff we're used to in the ways that we've always worked, all of the benefit that technology brings a modern society cannot be reached. We simply cannot get there. But you'll be pleased to know there are some things that we can do about it. And this is really, really relevant to your brands. When you're thinking about what the generic top-level domain means to you, I want you to think really, really broadly. I want you to think the big picture about what is it the service that we're trying to deliver to our consumers. Seeing the big picture changes your experience. I'll tell you a little story about when I was a kid. When I was 10, my old man used to fly light aircraft. And, and I don't know why I hold my arms out when I say light aircraft, because it's kind of like you don't know what one of those is, but anyway. And I remember this one day. We had taken off from a grass airfield in Derby, and we hit this big storm. And we get redirect, can't land at Derby because of the storm. You've got to go to Birmingham International Airport. Now, I don't know if you've been to Birmingham International Airport, but let me tell you. If you've taken off from a grass field in Derby, going to Birmingham International Airport, you might as well be on the moon at that point because you have no reference for what that is. It's orders of magnitude different from where you've come from. And I remember to this day, we start approaching Birmingham International Airport. We see the landing lights. My dad's face goes white. Jesus, Dad, what's up? He says, all right, Dave, runway's just a bit short. I'm like, all right, Dad, just, just get us down, all right. Usual thing, planes bouncing around, the storm's coming in, lightning, the whole ball of wax. We touch down, the tires are squealing, and it's last real sort of cut and dry whether we're going to make it. Dad pulls the stick back, tires are smoking, all of that stuff. We had one of those moments, do you know when you nearly crash your car and your body tenses up 
And then the moment passes and you go, oh. We had one of those moments. And my dad, he turns to me and he goes, Jesus, Dave, that's the shortest runway I've ever landed on. And I looked left and right out of the cockpit and went, yeah, and the widest too. <laughs> Thank you. And the point is, we do that every day, right? We chase the taillights of the car in front of us with our products, with our businesses, with our organizations, with how we think about technology, because we get increasingly narrow about the scope of what it is that we're doing. If you open up your eyes to the big picture of what your organization is trying to do with its customers or trying to do with the services or where you want to be as an organization, it will fundamentally change your approach, fundamentally change what you do. Now, this is a little bit of a British cultural example I want to give you. Um, so how many Brits have we got in the room, just so I know? A few, okay. So to the Brits in the room, can you tell me what this is? Tax disc, okay. This, in the UK, you have to display this in your windscreen because it proves that you've paid your road tax to the government. Now, more than just any old tax disc, this is actually my tax disc for my car and it replaces a tax disc that expired in October 2012. Now, at this point in the presentation, Microsoft's lawyers would like me to point out that it is still a criminal offence in the UK to drive without displaying a current tax disc. My car is obviously off the road, officer. <coughs> The point of this story is last Christmas I come down to my kitchen table. On my kitchen table is this beautiful, colourful, ornate piece of paper. And I'm thinking, that's beautiful, that is. And if you ever get a chance to look at these things, they really are beautiful pieces of, of paper. And I'm thinking, well, why is it on my kitchen table? Why is it not on my car? And then you realise, oh, yeah, I'm a bloke, therefore I'm a bit lazy. And then secondly, you realise we live in the UK. We live in a different world. Five years ago, there used to be thousands of police men and women, Bobby's on the beat traffic wardens peering in through the windscreen of everybody's car looking to see if this piece of paper was displayed. They don't do that anymore. We don't have them. Instead, there's a national series of cameras, a system called ANPR, Automatic Number Plate Recognition, that means every time I pull in for petrol, every time I drive down the motorway, every time I cross a city boundary, every time I drive past a cop car, pretty much, there's a camera. Looks at my license plate, says, has this bloke paid his tax? And it checks a database in Swansea. And it says, has he paid his tax? Yes or no? And if it's yes, off I go about my business. And if it's no, I guarantee you I'm going to get my colour felt by the old bill, which is common vernacular in the UK for the police. And the point of this story is the DVLA, so the UK government agency who's responsible for this bit of, pa bit of paper, like any other government agency around the world, are constantly under pressure for how they save money. They've got everything screwed down so tight, there's nothing else that they can do to save money except to change how they work. And what they've done is they said, well, hang on a minute. We've got a multi-million pound printing industry here that's dedicated to the creation and curation of these incredible artifacts of British motoring heritage. Why? We don't need them anymore. And for them, think about it, this process goes back to 1921. It's the single most important source of revenue for that organization. They've got the guts, they've got the confidence to stand up and say, do you know what? We live in a different time. They have a proposal out now to rid the UK of these pieces of paper, as lovely as they are. So my challenge to you is you're sitting there thinking about what you're going to do with your brand. How is this going to work? I want you to think about what can you do differently based on the fact we live in a modern digital society. We have consumers who are powered up with technology, who expect more from technology, from the, how they interact with brands. What is it that you all are going to do differently? That is the key challenge for us. You have to remember that marketing is a context sport. Marketing is all about the context of the individual. What is it that they want to do? We talk to people all the time about this, especially with mobile marketing. Because the th point about mobile is, well, by its nature, you're mobile. So you, as a brand, better bloody think about why would somebody who is busy running around doing whatever they're doing, why would they take time out to engage with your brand on a small screen? And if you understand that and deliver the service around that, you will have loyal, engaged, happy consumers and customers. And it's the same thing for what we're doing with the domain, is we've got to think about the context of what the consumers will do. Because at the end of the day, people are human beings. It may come as a shock or surprise to some of you, but people are human beings. And if we are all human beings, we're all consumers. If you think about yourself, excuse me, what is it that I would want from this service? What is it that I could have? Then actually it will change the experience that you build. 
Because you should be, the goal of what you're doing with the brand and how you deliver this is about empowering other people, empowering consumers. What is it that you're going to do to empower them to have a great experience, to be able to do things differently? You have to make the value explicit. Make it really, really clear what the consumer is going to get from using the service that you've built and the new domains. What is it that they do? Because if you do, then they will come back time and time again. And then I want to leave you with two thoughts, and that these thoughts are about the role of technology in our society, and we all have a part to play in this. And with the change that you're all facing, I really want you to consider this point about how do we help human beings become greater than the sum of their parts. Because this is how people live. We don't live in the Terminator. The machines, let me tell you, are not out to get us. The internet is not Skynet. But increasingly, we're not using technology in that way. And I just want to share with you a little, a little story from my son. Uh, who a couple of years ago um, just really helped me understand the importance of technology in our society. And basically, it's a Saturday morning in the Copland household. My wife's upstairs. She's busy. I'm looking after my son. Now, for me, when I look after my son, that means he's on his DS, you know, because I'm a good dad. And the conversation goes a bit like this. He runs into the kitchen. I'm cooking lunch. He says, Dad, 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 you've got to help me. got to help me. I'm stuck on Mary and Luigi partners in time. Level five boss, man. You've got to help me. And I'm, I'm busy, man. I'm like cooking, right? I'm busy. This is complicated stuff, right? Your dad's doing. I'll be with you in five minutes. And because I'm a good dad, five minutes turns to 10. 10 minutes turns to 15. And then by the time I'm done, table's set. He's gone, disappeared, buggered off. John, where are you? I'm in your office. What's he doing in my office? I go through to my office. I catch him red handed. He's six at this point, remember? He has not only got my computer, which he has boot it up. He's gone to a web browser. He's gone to a search engine. He's gone to Bing. He knows to go to Bing, because if he doesn't, he gets constructively reminded. <laughs> and he's typed in, Mario and Luigi, partners in time, walkthrough. Now, walkthrough is a website that you go to that tells you, gives you hints and tips on how to beat the boss on the Mario and Luigi level five. Now, my wife, she remembers his first words. She remembers his first steps. I ran upstairs, a little tear in my eye. You're not going to believe what he's just done. He's just formed his first search query. I'm so proud. <laughs> because as a six-year-old, in his brain, what's happened, he says, do you know what? I've got a problem. And when you're six years old, not being able to beat the boss and marry Luigi partners in time is a big problem, probably the biggest problem you have as a six-year-old. And he's gone, oh, man. Dad's busy. Mom's busy. What am I going to do? Oh, God. Technology. Technology has the answer. And he's gone off, and he's used technology to help him get beyond that problem. This is the point of technology for us as a society. It enables people to do great things. We have to think about that. Now, don't just take my word for it. You would expect, as Microsoft, us to have a whole series of credible research by scientists, really thoughtful people. We asked a whole panel of experts, people who, whose lives are dedicated to not being constrained by how we think about life today. They only think about how life might be tomorrow. They think really broadly about what we could do with technology. And we asked them a series of questions to help us understand the potential of the future. I'd like to share that research with you today. Cars in the future will be way smarter than cars now because you can select anything. It'll have a computer in it for you, a TV. You don't have to drive the car anymore. It'll do stuff for you. It'll travel faster. You can do anything with it. Someday the house will be so smart it would know like what you want and what you like. You would press this button and just say what you would like and then it would automatically come out every time. Sometimes you wish that, oh, I wish I could have pizza right now. And you'd be like, Whoosh. But uh, you gotta speak clearly because you could say, hey, vegetables while coughing, and then something weird will come out, like some sort of weird new alien life form. Someday they'll make this mirror that, that, would, that would make it look like you're wearing what, what you wanna wear. I would be a ninja and I could try a million outfits and one of them would be red, one of them will be dark black, one of them will be light 
blue. Someday, robots will help me do whatever I want. Like, if you want to go to Paris, your, your robot will just, has, um, will just has, like, fly you there, express ride, or just teleport you there. And then give you a quick, um, and then, like, organize all the tours for you and everything, and, uh, um, and, like, help you get used to the jet lag and stuff. Like, they would, like, clean the room. They would, they would fix the house. Yeah, um, because, you know, with a little imagination, anything's possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, the whole point of my session today is to get you to think differently about the potential of technology. As you face all of the challenges that generic top-level domains are going to bring you and your brands and what you do, just if you do one thing, just think about the potential change that you can make. Think about the incredible things that you can do. Don't just do it for me. Don't just do it yourselves. Please, ladies and gentlemen, if nothing else, do it for the kids. <laughs> Thanks very much.